watching today's teaching from Community Life Church. Open up your heart and see what God might say to you today through His Word. In some of the best stories, places become more than just backdrops for the action. They become characters themselves. Unyielding mountains, unpredictable seas, and in the story of Christmas, a tiny town that birthed Israel's greatest king, and the king who was yet to reign. David's birthplace was so insignificant that it could easily have been lost to history, swallowed up by Jerusalem just five miles away. But God made a promise to this little town through Micah, the prophet. Bethlehem, God said, you are smaller than most of the towns in Judah, but from you will come for me a ruler over Israel. So little Bethlehem waited, ready for the birth of her second king, the promised one of God. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here today. And I have a message that is just burning in my heart that I have been waiting to share with you today. So I just want to pray, just want to start um, with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive in. Lord, would you just open our hearts right now? Would you open our ears, open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us today through your word, through this time of the year, this season? And I just thank you for the chance to share your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to just dive right in. I want to just read a portion of the transcript of that video, just in case you missed it. Because when I watched this video um, a couple months ago, just in preparation, there was something that just captured my heart. Let me read this to you. It says, Bethlehem was so insignificant that it could have easily been lost to history, swallowed up by Jerusalem just five miles away. And I want to start, I'm going to stop right there and ask, can anyone relate to that word insignificant? Have you ever felt just insignificant, kind of small? You know, I feel like we can all relate to that in a sense. In this video there, there are two words, and these words are found in the pages of Scripture too. And I want you to say these words with me. That video said, Bethlehem was so insignificant, but God. I want you to say that with me, but God. Come on, I'm not going to, that's not going to do. Say, but God. Okay, Bethlehem was insignificant, but God made a promise to that little town through the prophet Micah. And that's what we're going to talk about today, a promise that was to a small and an insignificant place, but God. And some of us might need a little bit of but God in our life. Anyone? I don't know about you, but sometimes we need a little this is what's going on, this I feel small and insignificant, but God. And so we're going to just talk about this town of Bethlehem. It's, you know, it's central to the Christmas story. Before we go too much farther in this, though, I want to throw out a question, a question that I want you to ponder today as I'm talking, a question that I kind of want to haunt you maybe over the next few days in the busyness of Christmas that you would find some time to ponder this question And the question is this, who gets the final say in your life? Because we are going to see that although Bethlehem was this small and insignificant place, but God had a plan and had a promise, and God actually got the final say. So I want that question just to be in your mind. But before we get too far into that, I want to share, do you know what the greatest part about being a mom is? How many, how many moms do we have here? Okay, come on. The greatest part about being a mom is this. You get to say things to your kids that you promised yourself you'd never say when you had kids. Okay, anybody, when you are, you know, eight, nine, ten, when you're a teenager, 
I'm sure you have said this, I will never say that when I have kids. Well, guess what? That's You do. Um, so the greatest thing about being a mom is I get to say something that I hated hearing as a child. And you've probably heard this in some way, shape, or form, but it's these six words, if you want to throw that up there. I'm the mom and that's final. Anyone, can you say that with me? I'm the mom and that's final. When you're the mom, sometimes you get the final say, and it is awesome. But as a kid, I mean, imagine, okay, imagine me as a kid, if you can. Um, I would just push, push, push. I never took no for an answer. I am sure I drove my mom nuts. Um, and I always knew I was just such an intense kid, and I always knew that I had pushed far enough when my mom would get to the point and just exasperated and whatever it was that I was trying to get my own way when she would finally say, I don't care, I'm the mom and that's final. And I knew that was my cue, like, okay, there's no more discussion. And now I get to say that sometimes to my kids, you know. Um, but as a kid, we don't have a lot of choice on who gets the final say a lot of times in our life. But as we grow into adults, we actually do. And I want you to think about that for a minute today as we talk about Bethlehem. Who gets the final say in your life? Is it friends? Is it even enemies or people that have hurt you? Is it your spouse? Is it your boss? Is it yourself? Or does God get the final say as he did with Bethlehem in the Christmas story? So we're going to talk about that today. And, you know, I love Christmas. Bethlehem is central to the Christmas story, isn't it? It's, it's, we have this, um, this uh, what is it, Christmas carol, you know, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. I've been begging to like sing up here on the worship team for years and they won't let me, so I won't sing it to you. But we have Christmas carols right about this place, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. And this is kind of central to the Christmas story. And why is that? Because it was the birthplace of Jesus. It was the birthplace of Jesus. So as I was preparing, I started thinking, why do we make such a big deal about um, the birthplace of famous people? I started thinking, okay, have I been to any cool birthplaces? And I thought, I'll just share these with you, you know, some cool birthplaces that I've been to. If you throw that first one up there, about nine years ago, Rodrigo and I, and Camille was about four months old, um, went to England, and we got to visit Shakespeare's birthplace. Okay, are there any Shakespeare fans in here? I'm not really one either. It was, it was pretty um, anti-climatic. Like, okay, I'm in the room where Shakespeare was born, and I'm like, am I supposed to feel something? It was, you know, I mean, it was, I can check that off. I've been there. But, I mean, birthplaces, we make a big deal, right? And then I have to kind of slide this into any message that I preach that I am originally from the great state of Iowa, go Iowa, go Hawkeyes, and we only have one United States president that is from my great state of Iowa, and that is Herbert Hoover. And as a kid, okay, kids that live out here on the East Coast, they get to go on field trips to like Jamestown and like Washington, D.C. Well, we went on a field trip to Herbert Hoover's birthplace. Um, it was kind of unimpressive. It was, you know, this little tiny house, and again, you're in there, okay, why is this birthplace such a big deal, you know, I, I don't get it. And then this just happened um, recently. If you throw that next pi picture up there, over Thanksgiving break, we went to visit my family who still live in Iowa. We were driving um, on this, driving along on the street, and off to the side was this building, and the kids are in the back seat, and I'm driving our minivan, and I'm like, hey guys, look over there, look at that building. Do you know what that is? And they're like, no, what is it, mom? I'm like, that is where I was born. That is Skiff Medical Center in Newton, Iowa. And they rolled their eyes so far back in their head, I thought they were going to get stuck there. Um, they did not think that was very impressive either. But in our story today, Bethlehem, is the birthplace of Jesus, actually has something to teach us today. And I want to look at this, this place, this place of Bethlehem. We're going to look at a promise that God spoke about Bethlehem because he got the final say when it came to Bethlehem. But first, I want to just take a minute. We're going to go on a little journey back in history, and I want to just remind us 
about this town, about the town of Bethlehem, a little bit of history. Because, see, we have the Christmas story over here that, you know, oh, yes, okay, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, Bethlehem was, had already been there. And something happened in Bethlehem. It was also the birthplace of this random guy in the Bible named David, okay? David was a small and insignificant guy. He was the youngest one of his brothers. And I want to actually go all the way back. If we have Christmas Bethlehem over here, this is Bethlehem at the time of David. And in 1 Samuel 17, it actually, it tells us, you know, David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. David was the youngest. David was not very important. He was the youngest one. He was pretty insignificant. And then an event happens that kind of puts Bethlehem on the map a little bit. And if we go to 1 Samuel 16, just a chapter before that, it says this, The Lord said to Samuel, Samuel was a prophet, kind of a big deal at this time, and the Lord says to Samuel, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, same Bethlehem as our Christmas Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So this event is happening in the same place where Jesus was going to be born, that the new king of Israel was going to be chosen from Jesse's family, one of his sons. So if you've heard the story, you, you might know the story. Jesse brings in his sons, but he doesn't bring all of them. He brings all of them except for David, because David's the youngest. He's not that important. He's out with the sheep, and his father just completely passes over him. So his other sons are in there, and Samuel's like looking at them, you know, okay, which one of them are supposed to be king? But God. But God says none of them are to be king. So he makes them all stand up until they go get, he's like, don't you have any other kids? They go out and get David. And God says, he's the one. He's the one, the young one, the unimportant one, the nobody. He's the one that I say is to be king. Because guess what? God gets the final say. God gets the final say. And that's what I want you to hear today through this message, God got the final say with David in, in Bethlehem, the same place where we're going to see the birth of Jesus. So David becomes the second king of Israel. He's a hero in the Old Testament. You've probably heard of him. He's famous even hundreds of years later. But David was an unlikely choice, right? He, he wasn't the oldest. He wasn't, you know, the most important and what I want to propose today is Bethlehem was also an unlikely choice for the birth of Jesus. And the reason I wanted to share this message today is because some of you might also feel like an unlikely choice. An unlikely choice for God to love, for God to forgive, for God to use. You might feel kind of like Bethlehem. And see, God made a promise to David all the way back here. In this Bethlehem, he made a promise that a king is going to come through your lineage, through your ancestry, through your descendants. A king is going to come. And, you know, ancestry and lineage was a big deal back then. You know, they didn't have Ancestry.com. I was talking to my friend Haley about, I want to do Ancestry.com. I haven't gone around to it yet, but I'm kind of obsessed with the royal family in England. Anybody else? And I just kind of feel like maybe if I do Ancestry.com, it might, I might be related to them or something because I'm so obsessed with the royal family. But back then, they didn't have Ancestry.com, but lineage and, and descendants, heritage, that genealogy, it's impossible to overemphasize how important that was. And God said to David, there's going to be a king that's going to come from your line that will be on the throne forever. And so by the time we get over here to this Bethlehem, that town of Bethlehem was small. It was a humble village, unimpressive, insignificant, but God. So right in the middle of David and the birth of Jesus, guess what? There is a promise. God made a promise through the prophet Micah to the town of Bethlehem. And we're going to look at that um, in just a minute. But I wanted to talk about who was Micah for a minute. I, it's maybe not a book of the Bible that we read very often. Micah was a prophet. 
to the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah in the 8th century BC. And guess what? At that time, prophets spoke the very words of God. It was as if God was speaking. So Micah is telling these people who had turned away from God, basically, there's judgment coming. Like, you know, there's some judgment coming, but there's also restoration and there's also blessing on the way. And so tucked away in this book of Micah is this promise that I want to read in Micah 5, 2 through 5. So let's just look at this. Let's just look at this for a second. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Ephrathah is just the district where Bethlehem is located. But you are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. He will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be the source of peace. So this is a beautiful prophecy about Jesus. But I want to focus for just a minute on verse 2. Because Bethlehem, you're just a small village. You know, if we stop right there, we can relate. At some time in our life, we've been able to relate. Someone has said, you're only this, or you're only that, or you'll never be this, or you'll never be that, or we've said that even to our own selves. And as I was studying and looking just at some of the different translations, the way this is translated, these words just kind of hit me because we've been there. We've felt small. We've felt insignificant. Look at this. Bethlehem, you are small. Bethlehem, you're only a small village. Bethlehem, you're too little to be among the clans of Judah. You're out of your league. You're in over your head. Have you ever felt like that? Bethlehem, you're one of the smallest towns. Bethlehem, you remain least. Bethlehem, you are seemingly insignificant among the clans of Judah. So too small, insignificant, least little. And if we stop right there, you know, we've all felt that. But I want you, my friends, to read on in that verse because guess what? But God. It says yet, that's another way of saying but God. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you on my behalf. This is where God says, guess what? You, remember, we're making a promise that's going to be fulfilled in Christmas. You get to be the setting, the springboard for my son to be born. Where I will come to this earth in flesh. I don't care that they say you're little or you're small or you're insignificant. I get the final say. God gets the final say. Has anyone been there? Have you ever been in a point where you're just listening to all these other voices or even your own voice. But you have to tune all that out and say, God, what have you promised to my life? What does your word say about who I am? And we have to just get to that place where God gets the final say. Because it didn't really matter what other people said or thought about Bethlehem. You know, if you think about, it said in the video, Bethlehem was a small village. It was only about five miles away from Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is the well-known city. That's where the temple is. That's where all the important things happen, was in Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but I've sometimes felt like Bethlehem compared to Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem is all this, and I'm just Bethlehem over here. And I bet you've been there, too. You know, I'm small, I'm insignificant, I don't have it all together, I don't have much to offer. What could God possibly do with my tiny little life? But God, but God. And this prophecy that's spoken from Micah eight centuries earlier will be fulfilled. And God, I'm, if you don't know this today and if you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear, God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. And I want to look now in Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to see the but God. If you throw up Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, just these first few words, 
Jesus was born where? Where was Jesus born? Okay, come on. Jesus was born where? In Bethlehem. The same Bethlehem of David back here, the same Bethlehem that Micah talked about. God kept his promise. Do you see that? God got the final say. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Do not miss the significance of those words. A small, forgotten place, forgotten by the world, but not forgotten by God. And this is what it says. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, here come the wise men that we know in the Christmas story. Some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where's the newborn king? We saw his star as it rose and we've come to worship him. Did you catch where the wise men went? They didn't go to Bethlehem. They went to Jerusalem because that's where you would expect to find a king. You would expect a king to be born in an an important place. It would not have crossed their minds to look in Bethlehem. If you want to go back for just a second, Chad. Um, they, They went to Jerusalem, this big important city, instead of Bethlehem, this small, insignificant place. And as I was kind of thinking about this, I felt like kind of Bethlehem would have kind of been like a last pick. And I don't know how it was for you when you were a kid and you were in gym class, but um, did anyone ever play kickball in gym class? Okay, so in Iowa, where I grew up, it's very cold. So we spend most of the winter and half of the spring and half of the fall indoors for PE class. And they probably do it different now, but back then we played a lot of kickball and they would choose a team captain. You know, team captain over here, team captain over here. And I have a lot of um, gifts and talents, but um, kickball is not one of them. So I was usually a last pick for the kickball team, okay, in gym class. And I've, you know, through years of therapy, I've gotten over that, but um, just kidding. But I started thinking about that because sometimes I've felt like a last pick in life, too. And maybe, maybe you have, too. And that was Bethlehem compared to Jerusalem. The wise men went straight to the most important place, to the big place. Bethlehem was kind of a last pick. But God. See, it doesn't matter because but God. And I want to look at the rest of this story in Matthew 2. If you go to the next slide now. So they did some digging. They said, we came to Jerusalem. We're looking. We want to worship this newborn king. And so it says, he, King Herod, called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the law and said, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? We're looking for him. And they remembered what God had said through the prophet Micah. They said, in Bethlehem, in Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, you, small, insignificant Bethlehem, who will shepherd, be the shepherd for my people, Israel. And those religious leaders remembered what God had said because God gets the final say. God gets the final say. And I felt like today to just ask you, what have others said or what have you said to yourself that you're to this or to that? You're not enough this or you're not enough that. And I felt like I was supposed to ask you, why are you letting those people have the final say? Because God wants the final say in your life. If he said, I want my son, the savior of the world, to come from a little no-name place called Bethlehem, then so be it. You know, if God says over here about David, the same place in Bethlehem, I want David, the, the least, the unimportant one, the youngest, I want him to be king, then guess what? He's king. And I felt like there were some areas that God wanted me to challenge you in today as I've challenged myself. If God says you are enough, then you are. If God says I want to heal your marriage, then cooperate with him. Let him have the last say. If God says I love and accept you, just the way that you are, then he does. If God has been saying to you, I want you to start a Bible study in your workplace, 
then do it. Let him have the last say. If God says, I want you to raise your kids with a passion for me and it's going to look different than everyone else around you, then do it. If God says, I want you to give away a big chunk of money this Christmas, well, you only have two days, so you better get out your checkbook. Give him the last say. If God says, I know everything you've done and I forgive you, his word says that, then would you believe it? You know, if God says, I want you to get up 30 minutes earlier and I want you to read my word, I want you to pray and just be with me, then set your alarm and give him the final say in your life. If God says, I want to heal you, I see your brokenness, then would you lean in and let him heal you? Who gets the final say in your life? Because Bethlehem was small and insignificant, but Bethlehem, I, God, said I was going to use you, so trust me. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had a guest speaker here, and many of you were here. Her name was Erin Whitmer, and she talked about her story and her journey of forgiveness. And we have a friend and someone who's part of our church that day that was challenged. There had been unforgiveness in a relationship in his family for over six years. And that day, he knew that he was supposed to start walking in forgiveness. And he let God have the final say and has started walking that out for that relationship to be restored. And I believe there are things right now that are being left on the table that you are supposed to do or you are supposed to be. But because someone's told you you're too small, you're too insignificant, you don't measure up, you don't belong, you're not loved or you're not enough, we're just leaving them there undone. And we're giving the final say to the wrong people in our life. You know, God said, Bethlehem, you're small, but I've chosen you. And a few hundred years later, just like that, God kept his promise. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We're going to close in just a second with a song, a powerful song. It's one of my new favorites, and you might recognize it from the radio here in just a minute. But through this song... Um, A couple weeks ago, God reminded me that he sees me. He reminded me that he sees me. It It was a Thursday a couple weeks ago. It had been just a really rough day. And there's been just the last few months, honestly, there have just been some rough things going on that that I just needed to know that God saw me, that he remembered me. And that day, my friend Hannah, many of you know her, um, randomly, this was probably like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, texted me and said, I'm going to this concert tonight. I was going to go with a friend. She's sick and can't go. Do you want to go with me? And normally, I'm super type A scheduled personality. Normally, I would have said, no, I have this with the kids, or I have to do my grocery shopping, or I need to clean the house, or I need to meet with this person, or whatever. But God, in that moment, was just saying, this is my gift to you. You need this. I see you, and I see your struggles. I see where you fall so short, but this is my gift to you. And so I went to the concert. It, we had a great time. It was, it was really fun. But one of the, the songs that they sang at the end was the song we're going to hear in just a minute. It's called You Say. And this song makes a declaration that I will believe what God says of me. In other words, I will give him the final say because it doesn't matter at the end of the day what everyone else said about David, what everyone else said about Bethlehem, what everyone else thought where the king of the universe should be born in a palace. It doesn't matter. God got the final say. And I want to just encourage you today. I believe that God wants to challenge you with that in these moments. And I believe that God wants to just speak to us as we would allow our hearts just to be tender in just a minute as we hear this song. And so I just want to pray, and the same is going to sing this to us and over us, and just believe that God's going to just speak to your heart and just minister and, t- and, and just let you know what he's trying to do, what he's saying to you, and drown out all those other voices. So would you just bow your heads with me as I pray, and then we just go into this song. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you 
that what you say is true and you keep your promises. And right now in the quietness of this moment, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and for myself. And I pray that those areas that we have listened to the wrong voices, we have listened to what others have said, we've even listened to what our own mouth has said about who we are. God, would you let that fall to the side and would you give us the courage to believe you? Lord, would we look at this story, this Christmas story and see, does it really matter where Jesus was born? Yes, it does. Because you chose to use some, a place that was small and humble and insignificant of no importance. And you will do the same with us. So Lord, I just pray right now that you would just minister to us and just speak to us. In Jesus' name.
so much for watching today. For more information about our church, please visit our website at www.clife.church. We look forward to meeting you soon.